afternoon to our friends in India and of course a very good morning to our guest speakers today. I think before Gauri joins in and while we're getting past it, you can get a little straightened out. It would be a good opportunity for me to give a more deeper uh, introduction to our two guest speakers today so that the audience knows why it's truly worth listening in today for the entire one and a half hours. So, um, first up, Nina, some of you might have heard her at the last session as well. Uh, Christina has over about 25 years of experience in the selling and gaming industry, and her career spans both on land as well as online gaming. And she has dealt with all aspects of gaming operations, regulation, compliance, money laundering, the entire amateur. She's been a part of the operator community as well, holding senior roles both at William Hill and at Virgin previously. And currently, she's a principal at 1710 Gaming. She's been working with startups, investors, established operators, regulators, law enforcement agencies, and a number of them, especially on all aspects of betting gaming and the gambling strategy in particular. She continues to obviously practice as a licensed compliance officer and a money laundering reporting officer. Also, a committee member for the National Council on Private and Profit Gambling and an advisor to the AIGF uh, India, co chair of Dam Shield, and co founder of All the Timers Check. So with that very illustrious background, welcome Tina for today's session. Thank you so much for making time for us. Thank you so much. And we've got Jason as well. Jason Chess, a dear friend now for many years, working together with us on many UK India matters. Jason is a partner and co head of the betting and gaming practice group at Williams, a London based law firm, and one of the tier one law firms for the gaming practice in London. He has particular expertise in electronic betting and gaming, as well as various types of lotteries, competitions, and promotions. In his rather long career, he represents both platforms, operators, both providing land based as well as electronic gambling, and he also manages brand and media owners who use remote gambling to monetize existing audience. And he advises upon regulation and marketing of betting and gambling as well, and the associated issues of distribution and sponsorship. Jason, Jason is also a co-member with me at the IMGM, which is the International Master's of Gaming Law, and that's how our association. Welcome so much, Jason, and thank you for making time for our clients and patrons today. We do really look forward to listening in today to what you have to say as well. Thank you, Ranjana, and please can I um, say thank you very much to MD and the team, you and Gary in Mumbai, for putting together such a great event. Well, absolutely, and I do certainly hope that it lives up to the expectations of this audience as well as our panelists today. So great, so let's directly segue right into the session. We have our third panelist, my colleague and uh, co-head of the media, uh, media entertainment and the betting practice. Uh, she is a very known face on BCCEP platform, so I will spare everyone the introduction yet again for her and dive right into the session today. The next topic really how to implement an effective, responsible gaming strategy in a self. A part of the last session where Tina had graciously also joined us, uh, that was a kind of precursor to what we're going to talk about today. In case you have not had the opportunity of having viewed it, please do find some time and uh, have a look at the recording which is available as well on our platform. But just a quick precursor to give context to today's discussions. India, of course, is a self-regulated market, no formal licensing regulations for the gaming industry. What's really been happening in the last couple of weeks, uh, once COVID hit us and lockdown hit us in the country, was that on-demand entertainment consumption has obviously really increased. Nobody is really, it's not new information for anybody. Everyone sitting back at home has been heavily like, a lot of passive and active content on these platforms. But of course, passive content, um, like the content that you have on platforms like Netflix and the Kin, have obviously seen a complete boost in its viewership. But the kind of active given content that, uh, you know, what it offers to the audience, is really the much required active focus 
engagement that every week in uh, this kind of an environment is really kept devoid of but is really looking forward to. I think that being one factor, this genre of on demand content on online platforms is definitely going to be a better search in its viewership in the next couple of weeks for sure. Now, with a 1.3 billion population, a smartphone user base of about half a billion, growing to double its size in the next few years, and a gaming industry, potential is absolutely phenomenal being spoken about in all markets. India definitely has a lot to offer both the domestic and international community. If you really ask me, the potential of real money gaming as well would always be there because as human nature demands, gratification is always a very compelling factor to really bring back the body. That's not just me as well. In the midst of all the patient and good people coming out of the COVID situation, how we as patients and poor interest in a market which is not really regulated under a license regime, like probably other markets in the world where this industry is a established market. So exactly what we're going to hear and learn from our experts today is that how do we really reach a organic debt break that joined Indian industry to be a very responsible industry and up the ante in this game at par with the world standard. So Jim, thank you for the invitation to bring on our first speaker today, which is my colleague, Corey Bokke. Uh, but before I do that, why don't I quickly give a snapshot of how the meeting is going to today. We're going to have this session divided really into two halves, as we had announced it. The first half of us is really going to be focused on the panel and question in terms of how and why should it be a business is for India to really look at self regulation and responsible gaming as an important factor to build into your strategy. With love from both Corey and Jason on their perspective. And from there, in the next one hour, we're going to segue into a very interesting workshop where Christina is going to take us on how to strategize and implement an effective responsible gaming strategy for your own business in India. How do you adapt what you over an entire course of the day? But she's kindly obliged us by uh, making it a short one hour session for us. So please do enjoy. All right, right over to you. My first question. So, we have in the past deliberated many times over um, as to why India needs self regulation. You have been a very integral part, in fact, of putting in place the framework. That, you know, a lot of organizations have actually rolled out as well. You've been at the thick of things as well. One of the key aspects of all the self regulation framework, the much needed one perhaps, is the responsible gaming framework. I think what's relevant from the, for the audience today to hear from you would be why do you think that India really needs self regulation? Why is India self regulatory? And where responsible gaming is concerned, what would it entail, especially in the background of the existing Indian law? So, Gauri, please over to you. Thanks, Renat, and uh, hello, everyone. Those who are very regular on these sessions, I think you're going to get tired of me today because I'm going to speak on three panels back to back. So, I'm going to save some energy on this panel by letting Tina take over in the second half. Uh, uh, coming to your point, Ranjana, I think it's a very pertinent point by self-regulation and at the firm we have looked into this feature uh, you know, across different industries. Uh, for example, we have looked at OPT platforms when it comes to content, we have the crypto, you know, cryptocurrency entities, right, plus the, you know, and now we are talking about gaming. So what is the common feature in that? And also, uh, you know, we have looked at uh, also the case laws that have evolved in India in the context of self-regulation. When I look at this you know, holistic picture, what I see is one is some of the statutes are not industry specific, right? So they are horizontal statutes, and those statutes have criminal liability. So when you have this kind of a scenario, and what the courts also have recognized, 
is that when you have this situation that if this is the criminal liability and this is the horizontal law, what does it mean for me from a compliance perspective? So I think self-regulation or the self-regulatory bodies come in and demonstrate that when you say that okay PMLA guidelines you know have to be adhered or KYC requirements have to be adhered to which is you know know your customer requirements. What does it mean in the context of a particular industry? At what stage for example do you need to do KYC? So all these nitty gritty of the compliance is something that can be sort of told by the industry by you know, knowledgeable people who have sort of understand that industry and give that guidance to the industry so tomorrow if there is a criminal case being filed on any compliance at least that intention not to commit an offence can be argued very well in my mind just to talk more from a legal point perspective right now coming to the next point the next point is the when you have an industry and you are rightly pointed out where there is no single regulator because in India most, the, most of the industry is working in an exclusion scenario that means all the gaming laws which are state specific tell you that this is something which is a ill game then you know the liability doesn't apply you know from, come, come to you. Now then the question arises for the, whether a game is still or not is something which is a very subjective you know, matter depending on the facts and circumstances. So there also a self-regulatory body can come in so that we can uh, you know sort of demonstrate okay some oversight has been done by a self-regulatory body which can decide whether a particular game format is still or not and there is some guidance provided to the industry right for example in the Indian context there has been a lot of discussion people so obviously you know a self-regulatory body may not necessarily approve that game as a game of skill Somebody may, you know, stretch that imagination and say that no, no, we can, you know, sort of put that out. So that is the other element, which which comes to the, the first element itself of criminal criminality, you know, of offering a chance based game. But that is somebody has done an oversight, and Tina, for example, is, uh, you know, on one of the committees where they can, you know, look into the game formats and demonstrate that okay, you know, this is this is fine. The third element is the point that you made on consumer protection. Now. Traditionally, we have had a law which again is a horizontal law, correct? Which is a 1986 law, and now we have a 2019 law. Now, for the first time, interestingly, under that law, consumer rights have been articulated. And, uh, you know, for example, right to be heard, services, right of redress, which is a very broad framework which was not there earlier. There you have a consumer protection authority which will look into the fact whether the consumer rights have been violated and a class action can be initiated, right? So when you have this framework now being set up for a larger consumer interest, then in that situation also in my mind, the self-regulation, especially on the responsible gaming, comes in to demonstrate that the industry as a whole has been cognizant of the consumer interest. We have taken these steps. And if at all there is a you know perceptional violation, at least you have you know a conversation with the authority to say that these are the steps. Same thing that we see, uh, you know, I, I know I'm going slightly longish, but this probably will help you know other panelists to you know sort of look at things in an Indian context. Yeah. For example, unfair trade practices, restrictive trade practices, the definitions are very broad. What does it again mean in the context of gaming industry? You are able to articulate that to you know responsible gaming and self regulation. The third point is like for example uh, on the responsible gaming is from a consumer perspective, but even for example keeping a separate escrow account for consumer funds, right? Then if at all that is not kept, can there be an exposure of thought of conversion if there is a co-mingling of the funds, you know, with the funds of the operator? You know, these are fundamental multiple issues that you know, apply data protection right so if you really see when you have these exposure for the industry from coming from all fronts without a clear guidance of a gaming commission or otherwise you know at, at one place what this self-regulation does consolidate all these laws in one place and tell the industry this is your way forward for implementation of all these laws together. 
Now, specific on the, you know, for example, you know, there are grey areas. Tax position is in India is very grey, right? So, if the industry has taken a view after, you know, proper counsel, from, you know, external counsel, etc., then the industry is together. So, there are multiple, I can speak about, you know, 10 other grounds on which, you know, for which the self regulation uh, uh, should be, uh, you know, should be important. But I'll take the last point now from a consumer protection and the responsible gaming which Tina is going to talk about. As I said, that unfortunately, under the Consumer Protection Act, you will not find or any other guidance, you will not find anything specific. Also, how do you protect the consumer interest, for example, excessive gaming, right? Uh, sort of gaming beyond your means. Now, there is no guidance on like, you know, can I go shopping out of my means? Yes, I can. There is some freedom. But does it mean? That the industry just sits and be happy that you know let people you know sort of uh, uh, you know gamble uh, game or I don't want to say shoot the word gamble here but game endlessly the answer is no because one bad incident that happens that yes that will take the industry down because then the regulators will be different less than what is before when there is a grey area in India that is where the ethics come in and that is where you step in as a as an industry you know leader or you know, as, a, as an industry body, to say that hey, the gap for protection of our consumers, let's put it in for ethical reasons, it's not important. That is the way I look at it holistically on why self regulation and why responsibility. Over to you, then. So, Gauri, I'm going to first mention this that I don't think anyone's ever going to get tired of listening to you because your response will always be refreshing and fresh, always good to hear you, even if it's three times a day. And the, the other thing is that uh, having known you for 12 years, I think we need my mind and my further questions to you. So you pretty much answered everything I had and you kept you know, going go, go, go with the point. So that's great. That helps me segue to my set of questions now for Jason. It is coming from you, Jason. So Jason, yeah, yeah. Um, coming from London and with the enormous amount of experience that you have on, on the UK side of things. And Working with so many of the licensed operators, I think what would be burning for the audience to know is to begin with, but if you can check out how does UK really regulate gambling, some of us do know that, some of us don't know that. So a little bit of that, and then keeping in line with today's topic, um, especially on responsible gaming, we'd love to hear what is UK doing or has done in the past to implement its policies, and how effective have these really been? Basically, lessons to take from UK for us. Well, I, I think I think the most important thing, Anjana, is is what Gauri said. Um, can you hear me? Okay, is the audio okay, Anjana? Brilliant. Okay. You can go ahead. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Um, the most important thing is that in any business, in any industry, it's always much, much more preferable if the industry can make its own rules rather than have the politicians or the government force rules upon you. Um, we've all been a spectator or a participant in, in the process of making rules and the fact that India doesn't have a coherent federal system or, or even a, a, a very well developed state intra-state system of regulation um, is good. Because what it enables the industry to do is to demonstrate to society that the industry can offer this product in a responsible way. Because Harry's analogy with shopping, Rajana, was very interesting. Because, of course, yes, you can go shopping and you can spend a lot of money. But I think everyone in the gambling industry needs to face up to the fact that our products are, are not so much like an ordinary shop, our product is in the same sort of category as alcohol and tobacco. I mean, our product, or some of the product, shall we say, some of the more, um, some of the things like, for example, uh, slots and the more addictive forms of gambling, uh, they are addictive. And we need a social consensus as an industry. We need social tolerance. We need a social consensus. And we need the government, the authorities, the media particularly, and society more widely to tolerate us and allow us to do our business. And the way we do that is by showing that we take responsibility 
but the potential bad effects that can be caused by by these products. So I think in India, um, you've got a fantastic opportunity to shape the landscape and to engineer for for yourselves um, a social tolerance, a social consensus around product, and, and also to shape the regulation in a way that is favourable to the business, because you have vast potential um, revenue streams with the the disposable increasing amounts of disposable wealth, the smartphone, the connectivity, the broadband. Uh, I mean, I was in uh, I was in India eighteen months ago, and uh, you know the, the broadband and the connectivity is absolutely super digital platforms. Um, and what you really don't want to do is make all the sort of mistakes that are being made in Europe at the moment, which are causing society, the press, the media, religious people, and also the governments to turn against the gambling industry. And they are beginning to treat us more like tobacco than alcohol. You see, we want to be treated like alcohol, which is that this is a product in moderation, can be enjoyed, and it's pleasant, and you have a glass of wine. We don't want to be treated like tobacco, where the authorities are saying, well, even a small amount is bad for you. Um, and in you, I think Christina will come on to this later on in her session. But I think Dina would agree that particularly in the UK, um, the industry is in real danger of losing that debate at the moment for reasons we can come on to. Um, and it's, it, it's so important that the, that the Indian businesses come together with strong mutual trade associations um, and you know start establishing best practice so that you can demonstrate to society that, that, that online gambling is a business that should be tolerated that will generate tax revenues that will generate lots of digital jobs lots of software a real cutting-edge digital uh, industry you can contribute to the economy without causing social harm and if you can demonstrate that it's a good way of keeping the politicians off your back and a good way of keeping society tolerant. I can see Tina nodding fervently as well as... Do you have a point to add to this, Tina, at this juncture? I know that you have a wonderful operator's perspective on these things from the UK, having worked with them. We'd love to hear if you have something to reflect on this. Obviously, we'll take it in this session, but I'd particularly like to hear from you um, that, you know, when from an operator's perspective, it's, it's great to hear from a legislator's perspective, a lawyer's perspective, you know, why we need self-regulation or why do you even need responsible gaming as a part of a legal framework. But there are always those points in there that over-regulation always curtails innovation as well. And that's a very fine balance to make. And it's the operator who really is the right person to decide how to throw a little light on what have been the little stickler points and if there's anything that you'd like to add from the UK perspective at this juncture? Okay, thank you very much, Randela. And, and I have to say, I think both Gary and Jason elucidated perfectly the situation both in India but also in the UK. You know, I think anybody who has gaming, gambling, betting is, is in a similar situation. I guess in, in terms of your specific question, it's a bit of a double-edged sword. Sometimes prescriptive regulation makes it easier. You no, know, this is right, this is wrong. And when we look at some of the fines that have been issued by the UK Gambling Commission, a lot of it is because operators haven't perhaps been spoken the way the regulator wants. Some of them have just completely thrown the rule. Like, that's a different problem. Um, for me, I guess, you know, one of the things is, as we're all finding out under the COVID um, umbrella, necessity is the mother of invention or innovation. So, that, you know, that's, that's a good thing. The problem we've got as operators at the moment is we live in a world of technology costs money to develop. As an operator, you've got the integration time, the development time, the configuration and the cost. Area of you. what happens is if you integrate into a particular application as they come out with something new and exciting and the regulator says this looks fantastic everybody was unfortunately a lot of the technical solutions are based on what we knew so 
we spend all this time and money integrating, getting it right, and what we then find is that the customer changes the right there. So it becomes a constant case of cost, 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 stay relevant, keeping up with them. For me as an operator, I much prefer principle based regulation because that allows operators a degree of flexibility, operating in the spirit of the law, but to you know, manage costs as suits them as it is. And that kind of answers your question. And I'm sure there's a lot more that you have reserved for the one hour that we've been discussing during the workshop. Obviously, keeping in mind an operator's perspective too. Now, um, having heard both Jason and Tina, I think, Gauri, it's the right time to come back to you. Here. Having heard the international perspective, especially in the UK and how operators think about it, do you think some of these things are going to be secured in India? Is is an approach like this going to work in India? I have heard what you said. It does seem that you all seem to be in agreement. But if you'd like to add anything at this juncture, it would be great. Yeah. Yeah. So I think I think both Jason and Tina point together, of course. Uh, because what Jason mentioned is very important that you know, we don't want the regulator to come in and tell us what to do because we understand our industry better. At the same time, I came to what Tina said that I went on to what the regulator wants so there is clarity. I think it has to be a good balance between the two in terms of core There will be certain things which, for example, if the regulator can tell me, in your space, okay, these are the skill games, in your part, and you know, these are accepted skill games. So maybe I have in Telangana, sorry, in Nagaland where you can go and take an approval of a skill game, right? So maybe. I don't want to take a chance on that. But what technology to adopt? Is that a prescription going to come from the regulator? And that, that, that is something we are seeing in the Indian context like encryption. Right? For example, you know, the, the government was far behind that, that the, the technology. Right? So, in that context, uh, and what we have also seen in the technology, since you mentioned, Jason, on the, you know, the technology to be adopted and all. We have actually seen in some of the gaming cases that the courts were apprehensive to say that whether there is any, you know, in the background, there is any tampering happening, right? A couple of cases do, you know, do talk about that. And therefore, whether, you know, this should be treated as a game of chance and not speak because there is a possibility of tampering in a digital voice, right? So when these unknowns are to be seen, if there is a self-regulation or any, any other regulatory oversight to say that, okay, this RNG mechanism has been approved, certified, you know, all these things put some um, those anxiety of the courts also to rest. And the point that you mentioned about coming, you know, to a certain level of integrity, transparency, what you mentioned, Jason. We in fact had this situation in the Indian context where you know the gaming industry in certain uh, you know jurisdictions went overboard in in terms of advertising. Right? Yes. And uh, you know, that created certain issues even for the regulator within a particular state and the, the manner in which, you know, things played out for that state. So that is where that some, some restraint, especially because, you know, in India, for example, you mentioned tobacco and alcohol. Advertising of both is banned in India, right? So do we say that, okay, gaming also advertising should be banned? The answer is no, probably, but at least can there be a restraint? So I think somewhere to understand the industry that we are in and then to you know, play things out rather than going all over. I think that is the message that which I heard from Jason is in my mind very, very important even for the Indian operators to keep in mind to avoid a regulator or a, some body to come in and impose something. I rather demonstrate that I am behaving you know, appropriately on my own accord. Okay? Of course, with some guidance from the regulator. I think that is where I see both of your points, you know, sort of coming and helping the Indian context to make that self regulatory model. Yes, I, I, I think, Gary, the, the approach, um, as you know, the, the legislative approach um, in Europe has got three pillars. There are three big pillars or three big foundation stones to the to the, the federal, if you like, or, or the British legislation. And they are also mirrored in the Maltese, the Gibraltar, the Isle of Man, the, you know, the offshore jurisdictions. And they're also mirrored in, in the EU legislation. Um, for example, French, the, 
the, the Dutch, the Scandinavian. And the three big pillars are firstly that crime must be kept out of gambling. Um, and crime um, includes you know, bribery, it includes corruption, it includes match fixing, but it also includes the use of gaming, casinos, gambling websites for money laundering and for criminal spend. So number one is that the, 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 the governments, the authorities, society generally is saying to us, right, you keep crime out of gambling. The second thing is um, fair. And that, I think, what, what, what you, you refer to the courts in India having concerns about the, the fairness of the gambling. Does the product produce the correct return to player? Is the random number generated? Is this thing genuinely, statistically random? Uh, does it perform according to the rules uh, that we have disclosed to the player? So is the player getting a fair deal? That's the second one. And, you, and you're quite right, Gary, is that if there's anyone in the Indian market who is making available um, games with elements of chance um, and they are not certified by an independent, independent laboratory is working in a random manner, then that's, a, that's something that should be done because it gives public confidence um, and as you say it, 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 it helps you comply to fraud consumers you must make sure the product's fair and the third one and this is a really really big one and again I, I noticed from a, a preview of Chris, uh, Tina's slides that, that, that she's going to hit this later on the third one of course is the protection of the vulnerable because of course it, you're quite correct to say that people can go out and shop and they can spend a load of money in the shop but when you're spending money on a website um, the operator has a huge amount of data, a huge amount of transparency. Website gallery, they can see when you log on, they can see how long you play, they can see how much you spend, they can see whether you are chasing your losses, they can see whether you lose, and then you're playing again, and again and again and again in response to losing. They can see whether you're playing in the middle of the night, late at night at weird antisocial times when you shouldn't be. Um, and they can also see whether you are taking money out, are you taking your winnings out, or are you gambling again and again and again with your winnings. So gambling companies have a huge load of, of data, a lot of metrics on the people who gamble with them. And one of the problems we've had in Europe is that instead of using all of that data to stop people gambling or to warn people or to offer people the opportunity to set limits on their gambling or to take a break or to take time out or even to self-exclude completely. Instead of using that information to protect people, they've been using it for marketing to put people onto VIP schemes, Gary, and offering them more promotions, more incentives, more encouragement, when actually they should have been saying to them, hang on, stop, you're spending too much, are you sure you can afford this? And, and that is the third thing. The third thing is the protection of vulnerable, the third of the pillars. And you know, if then the government will step in with a big stick at you. So, you know, there's an awful lot. And again, Tina's, Tina's presentation later on, you know, will be a good, a good, good blueprint. Your products must be fair. They must be, you know, they must operate according to being random. And you really must keep any smell of crime out of your business and you must know where the money flowing into your business is coming from. And the third thing is please, please use all of the rich data that you've got to protect people so that the media and the press and the politicians can't accuse you of making money off the back of, of addicts, of, of, of problem gamblers. And those, those things have gone to Europe. And it's so, so, so important. It's such a, a, a potentially rich, massive market that you get those three things right. And you get the, those three things right, and it seems to me to be the passport to an incredibly exciting business future for the Indi Indian industry. Yeah, that, that's very good, guys. That very fantastic background from both Gauri and Jason. I think um, there's lots of food for thought, not just for operators, but even for regulators who would be watching and listening in, because I think there was something to learn out of it in terms of how you can approach future regulation to keep the balance going, same time 
what are the real pain points that you need to look at while addressing and what do you need to focus on? Is what the panelists brought out in the first half of our discussion. And now, Gina, I think it's the perfect background to which we can be with your part of the workshop today. So uh, perhaps uh, my colleague Rupi should also uh, put up your presentation to help you with that. Gina, all over to you now. Thank you very much. Um, just whilst Mukesh is pulling all this together, I'd just like to reiterate Jason's thanks at the start of the piece um, in terms of putting this together. What I'm hopefully going to do is not duplicate, but then add to what has already been covered by the panelists. This is very much about responsible gaming, and I deliberately use the term gaming rather than gap. So, um, Rajana, if I understand correctly, what we will have is uh, we'll be fielding questions as we go, and when we get to natural pauses, if opportunity arises, you might be able to take some questions from people who are listening. That's absolutely right. You can go ahead with your presentation, and for all the participants listening in, please bump up your questions out there, and uh, obviously, we are going to be taking it in a certain pattern. If we believe it's going to be taken up later on in the session, Take your question at that juncture. Otherwise, at the natural process that happens during the session, we will take a lot of your questions. Idea is in fact we do workshop of one and a half hours today, so that we can have more and more questions addressed for the panel for the panel today. Gina, all over to you. Thank you so much. Hey, so good afternoon. If you're all sitting comfortably, we will begin. As Ranjana said, my job in respect of uh, my day-to-day -day role as a compliance officer is to actually go out there and implement regulations. But every country is different. So we're going to take a step back. For me, social responsibility has three different steps. Firstly, you've got the legislators who come up with the laws and the policies. Then have the regulators whose job is to pull out the rules of the game and then to go and slap people on the wrist if they're not playing by. And of course, there's the operators who get slapped if they get it wrong. Their job is to implement the regulation. What we're going to focus on today is the final piece of that puzzle, which is the operators. The special point that we're going to cover is perception. Your chance. Local versus global. Regulated versus unregulated. Just look at things like care and commercial considerations. Proactive player management. How and why? Identifying and supporting potential. Five step strategy which I personally employ and which I think would be appropriate for a self regulated environment. We're also going to look at some of the missing pieces. They are just as As far as responsible gambling goes, the story so far, most of what we know about responsible gambling is based upon male sports. Male casino table game players, female slot players, female casual slot players. Most of the research, most of the behavioural traits and the recommend come out of UK and Europe, Australia, North America. Of course, as the rest of the world starts to kind of jump on onto the game in bandwagon, think of it. But everything we know and a lot of what we've implemented in Why is this important? India? Let's have a look at the Indian one. Table Look at daily fantasy or even beliefs about skill and judgment. It's not about that. Closest in your get gambling is go on and the casino. Yes, we've got Nagaland, we've got Sikki, but they are really closest to what West is just. And there again, you've got skill with a little bit of 
Now, if I can get stories about what's happening in India, the UK, I'm pretty damn sure people in India can get stories of what's happening. And those of you who are into East London, well, you know what, well, that's sitting slightly separate from Canaan, yeah. Not so. What? Canaan can mean many different things to many different people. Biggest sponsor of esports and esports betting right now in the world is a company called. So anybody hoping to divorce the two, you need to be. The public's perception is getting closer and closer together. And more commonly, when you see the word esports, very closely next to it is the word. Now this is the kind of thing people really are not against. But what you have there is different forms of criminality as well. People assaulting each other. You've got a teenager stealing his father's money. Being called worse than drug addiction. He's causing poor grades in school. And that poor girl in Chandigarh lost her life. She killed herself. Those of you who are from fun of the sports world, you actually need to sit up, smell the pot, and start doing something. World and its conceptions of your product or something. If I might just, um, yeah. I just say one thing, it, it, it might be worth that those are incredibly important, well made points. Um, and public impact and, and the harm of those points, uh, of those stories, sorry, of those bad stories. Um, damages the industry, even though in statistical terms, the actual incidence of problem gambling or pathological gambling is very low. So I think the point to make that I would make is that your examples um, cause damage to the industry, even though statistically problem gambling in the British market is now um, below 1% and, and declining. So you know, the industry in overall terms, even if the industry does a good job, um, these stories are still incredibly harmful. Um, and it's a real argument for putting the protection of the vulnerable and social responsibility right at the top of the agenda because they are politically sensitive out of all proportion to their statistical frequency. No, absolutely, absolutely. And, you know, as, as most people will know, um, Gaming or gambling is not something like Gary mentioned before, shopping. It is something a small group of people do, not the whole nation. So it's very easy for politicians and the media to get behind these stories. They are for them. It's important. Well, we're finding that in the UK, where the political um, landscape and opinion has shifted towards being a bit more anti gay because of the stories. Absolutely, it's a public perception. So, can I just add a couple of points? Because, you know, in, in the Indian context, the points that you make in are absolutely important. Uh, and what to what Jason said is that the politicians, regulators, courts may not necessarily, in the first blush, be able to make that distinction skill or not. And when, you know, when we started looking at even international, uh, you know, discussions and all that, people are moving away. When it comes to responsible gaming versus skill or no skill, chance doesn't matter. Responsible gaming, you know, sort of underlying which is required, irrespective of whether it's gaming or gambling. The other thing is that you mentioned, you know, all these stories, for an analogy, that we know that the regulators are very concerned about PUBG, and that was one of the questions that came in, right? So, whether you know, now PUBG is self regulated or not, that part of the industry is not. But the moment they look at it, again the regulators and the courts and the courts are not taking the difference between those type of games and skill games, right, which are being given even less by the court for that matter. So this, whether 
you know, the, the question really is that whether as a stakeholder in the industry, and I think that is what I'm hearing from you, as a stakeholder in the industry, it is getting important not to just look at, okay, skill gaming, you know, I will protect the skill gaming and do everything for that, but a holistic picture as to what do people perceive as gaming and try to see whether you can go beyond and try to create an ecosystem. Is the point I'm hearing from you, Pina? Is, is that correct? Absolutely right. That's the, and you're absolutely right to the public. Gaming, gambling, playing, it's all the same thing. And if that's how the public perceives it, you're absolutely right. That's how politicians and legislators who don't know the detail will perceive it. Absolutely. Um, I'm just finishing on that section. The other thing is player perception. And this is where we go back to the images of entering and demanding them. The question will be, if overseas sites targeting the Indian market, regulated in the UK, Malta, Curacao, and who also offer poker, fantasy, and betting on esports, promote responsible gaming. Why don't the Indian offer? Because they don't care. This is not from the UK, you can see the URL. And what they promote is responsible gambling or games for poker sports. And sports will include betting on And of course, you also have it in country. Poker Stars has taken what it has outside of India and simply rebranded. The structure of the websites, all the rest of it is exactly as you would like. So if you operator in India, homegrown, are not sending out the same messages about responsibility. The second is, and I'm going to start thinking. Questions so far? So I think we should take one interesting question because you mentioned esports, the question by Harsh. In most of esports, players play through remote locations. How does the industry keep a tab over issues of cheating? I don't know, Tina, this comes in the later part of the session, or do you want to touch upon it right now? But I'll touch upon it right now, uh, just because we're kind of doing an abridged at pace course. Sure. Um, that, that part of that goes back to what both Gary and Jason have met, mentioned. You have technical standards. So, you know, one of the three pillars is fair and objective a fair experience. So you would have technical standards, you might have game certification, where you want people kind of playing from remote locations, and I guess it's an example of something like a network. Again, you would have technical standards which are there to ensure the integrity. In the case of esports, you also have not just the technical integrity, so things like download speeds, which impact on what happens, if, if you have a lag in terms of placing a bet in poker, you might lose the hand. Similarly, that can happen with esports. They mean that your, uh, your character gets hit before you get that into the game. Have technical standards that are required, first as a starting point, but then also monitoring to make sure things are okay. The other thing esports would have, and betting on esports is starting to look at this now. If you're the person playing esports, you can be bribed, just as you can with spot fixing in something which gives somebody else the advantage, creates an event or an incident in the game which results in somebody else. But to answer Harsh's question, it's regulation, it's technical standards, and it's ongoing one. The same principles as poker, the same principles as betting uh, integrity, and what we're exploring in the world of esports right now with this esports. Maybe you can proceed with the next part. Thank you. So, the next thing is. Proactive player management. It's no good you saying 
we have a tab on our site that says responsible game. That won't pull it. But before we look at that, I just want to take you back again a step and recalibrate your brains in terms of what a propaganda looks like. We all know what this is. John Montague, the fourth bird of sandwich, first recorded compulsive gambler. He didn't want to leave the card table in the middle of playing, including for dinner. So he asked servants to bring him a slice of meat bread. So he could carry on eating and playing. And others around him started to say, I'll have the same as sandwich. Next time you have a sandwich, just remember that without problem gambling, you would, or if you were, you wouldn't be eating the sandwich. This kind of problem game is not just about problem. As an over, it's your first self excluder or self man. You realize very often he used to play big, he used to win big, but he would lose it again because he. So, as history has shown us, he had the self-awareness to realise he had a gaming problem. He self-excluded and he found something else, which he, again, couldn't stop doing, but was actually less powerful. And this is Pamela Anderson. She was playing poker one night and she was down 200 quarter of a million dollars. She paid off by making out the person she owned the money. Actual thing. People can pay off debts in different ways. That can have ramifications. Could be getting rid of your wife and kids as a couple. Or it could be something else. And that something else could be linked to the point is, anyone can be a problem down. All of these people would be a potential problem. Your job is not a point for something like that. It's to look at these people. In, in your head, decide what are the safe reasons for game. They to be unsafe. Just a couple of examples, you know. It might be a social activity that you do with friends. That could be playing cards at you early. An unsafe one could be peer pressure to be part of the gang. And in a nice way. Some people go out and play your friends are doing daily fantasy. So you're going to do it as well. The other side of it can be your lonely. And actually, gaming is a way of socialising and spreading. I leave that with you, but you as individual businesses need to think for yourself. What are the safe reasons for engaging with your people? What are the less safe? The other thing to do is monitor player activity. Jason already mentioned some financial activity. Any kind of trigger there which suggests somebody is getting over and above what they can afford to play. And they're playing through winning to take the money from there. They're an escalating or de escalating pattern in terms of the source of their gaming activities. And they have long gaming sessions without a break. The door will break a poker or a running club. For somebody log in at nine o'clock in the morning and they're still there at nine o'clock at night. You're probably if you want a deposit in it, they constantly keep you taking it. Have a look at the activity in chat rooms and forums. Is that a sign? What's communication, conduct and behaviour? Do they say things like the game is unlucky? Do they use keywords in their you're running KYC and you're asking for your Their reluctance to share something. They're showing signs that they have been spread or angry for us. Side as individual business. What is appropriate? 
what is abnormal or concerning you. Questions? I think we, uh, we've answered a fair part of them, but do the panelists have any questions for Tina? Else we could roll on. Yeah, Tina, I mean, the last slide where you, you, you cut out the, if you like, the triggers, but um, it's perhaps worth worth pointing out for, for everybody listening that those bullet points that Tina's put up on, on that slide um, are what the, what the European regulators uh, refer to as triggers, and they're warnings of pathological behaviour. And the regulatory expectation um, in Europe throughout all of the jurisdictions is that a gambling company should be capable of monitoring those behaviours, of spotting them, and then of doing something about them, whether it's an email or whether it's a phone call, whether it's imposing limits or whether it's talking to them. But the company is expected to engage whenever they see those things happening. And part of the problems that Tina referred to earlier was where people have spent hundreds of thousands of pounds in a huge amounts of money. All of those triggers have appeared and nothing was ever done. No questions were asked. Um, there were never any phone calls. There were never any emails. There was never anybody reaching out to these people so you should be gambling all through the middle of the night. Um, and the fact that nothing was done has really got the industry into some of the problems um, that we looked at earlier in the presentation. So you've got to have the analytics of the systems to spot those triggers and to do something about them when you do spot them. Oh, I, I have a question for both Tina and Jason. This is in the context of GDPR because, uh, you know, Europe has it with GDPR and India is in the midst of looking at a private law. So the behavior, trending, profiling, etc. that you mentioned, how does GDPR you know, fit into this because you are then monitoring somebody else's behavior and if that consent of monitoring is withdrawn by me, right? Do you still, does the gaming law override the GDPR in that context? Because otherwise I can completely withdraw my consent for a, you know, processing for a particular purpose. So I'm quite curious because India is looking at a new law, uh, that's the question, that's the reason. Okay, um, I don't know, Jason, do you want to take that first? And I'll very happily give you what I do from an operating standpoint. Yeah, no, it, 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 it's a good point, Gary. Um, I, I think under data protection legislation, there are two things. First of all, um, obviously the privacy policy requires the player to, to consent to the data being used. But secondly, the use of that data for those purposes is, is an obligation imposed upon the operator by law. Uh, and so really the operator, you know, stopping using that data is, is um, the, the use, I think, the justification of it under GDPR is that it is necessary for the obligator, for, for the operator to, to comply with statutory obligations. Um, and I suppose the analogy, Gary, is where you have someone who's been money laundering or you know, laundering the proceeds of crime, and they say to my personal data to inquire where the source of my funds has come from. Uh, and the answer to that is, well, I'm, look, look, I'm sorry, but um, if, if, if I have reasonable suspicion that you've been money laundering and you're spending the proceeds of crime, um, then I'm under an obligation to make inquiries whether that involves your data or not. So uh, I think the way the operators look at it is, is that we have to do this in order to comply with our license terms. Um, what I do, and, I, and I, I speak from somebody who has to write these more in terms of conditions but then implement the regulation. So in part, Gary, you're right, sometimes the regulation overrides um, the data protection and, and privacy side. So for instance, money laundering regulations can see you go to prison. Obviously, we don't want that. So we're going to listen to the money laundering regulation for data protection. But the way I, I tend to manage it is the customer, not just the privacy policy, but the customer terms and conditions that the uh, customer must sign up when they register with you. 
will actually say in there that we have to monitor in accordance with our license obligations. And if a customer withdraws their consent, that means we can't continue to monitor, which in turn means regrettably we can't continue to monitor. Right. Um, and I don't know what the Indian regulations might say, but in the UK as well as Europe, you have this phrase which is legitimate interest. So yeah, the customer might contact you and say, I don't want you to do this, I don't want you to do that. Um, a good example is if a customer says, I would like you to delete my information. You might have under the money laundering regulations and legitimate reason to maintain as you can say more. In the UK as well, one of the reasons that we might have for retaining or using data could be in terms of minimising harm, the public interest. That's an improper gambling issue as a health uh, issue or the rest. The easiest way is just to put it in your customer terms and conditions and say, if you say you don't want this, we can't. Okay. So, five step strategy. If I was running an operation in India, what would I look at to keep visible regulators, or let's call them politicians, or public? This is what I would look at. Five steps. Responsible gaming policy, awareness, education, and engagement, marketing, advertising, player tools, and player profiling. My responsible gaming policy would be customer facing. But what it would talk about is a commitment to responsible gaming or responsible. As you see there, it's not customer KYC. Who are they? Where is that money coming? Jason alluded to it as well in terms of the middle of the Have on site testing on your website. Have information about how players can stay in control. One of the things you can have is a self assessment questionnaire. If anybody wants one, get in touch, more than happy to share the ones. Information on how to keep children safe or vulnerable people. You can buy tools, applications, that's not the classes of games. More and more parents are doing this to make the amount of time spent on video. Of course, where a customer or a player who feels they might be at risk or a bit hard, don't let them. Awareness, education, and engagement. Train your staff. They are your foot soldiers, they are your front line. They're the ones who are going to say, I think this customer might help. Interact with those things. But you need to think about how you communicate with them. So when you're doing that, look at the product and look at the gender, look at the age, the way you speak with the different players at the top might be very different to the way you speak to the lady promoting money and club might be very different to how you speak to the people at the bottom who are digital natives. The top, you might send an email to a big friend. Once at the bottom, actually, what's that like for? What's the language? What's the tone of voice? So think about how you're going to talk every time. Don't forget employee safety. People who work in the industry our products more than anybody else and therefore just this like that. Marketing and advertising. Is there a voluntary code of practice? Where do you market? When can you market and how can you do it? What are the marketing channels? Media, the broadcast media. Don't forget social media. You have a code for marketing and advertising on social media. Especially if you have ambassadors and advocates, have matters and sports models. Language and images. 
not good to go out there and say gambling is going to make you richer or sexier. Also, you may want to not use images of What about the ambassadors of the sponsor? Also sponsorship. And of course, bonuses and promotions. Bonuses and promotions is a great way to get people. Have somebody who keeps money with you. Fair chance they're going to lose money with you, but also start to form a reliance on you. Play a management tool. Look at what tools you can have in place. Have a self assessment quiz. It doesn't have to be a big stick set on them. Make that self-assessment with products and symptoms. Try and match it with a phone. When you talk to an older uncle or auntie, it's going to be very different. Make that in your community. Offer deposit play a loss limit. One of the most effective things is when somebody logs in, not only do they see their available balance, Next to it, they see it. Nothing will make you sit up and take notice of something which says this is how much you've lost. Have session time limits. Allow customers to be able to say, I've been playing for three hours, make me stop. Introduce taking a short break or calling off or apply self description. Of course, player profiling or ritual. Every obvious. Not just the age and ID, but their background. Do a little bit of research. Customer service people are very curious. Tell them to go and be detained. Find out about particular customers. What is their lifestyle? What is their background? Have a look on things like LinkedIn, social really rounded image of this My operational commercial or you know about them, as you can protect them from harm, but actually the more you understand the player, the better you can understand the better you can provide a product to the customer. So there are also commercial advice. Take that game to that new user. Develop a potential problem game along. In some of the things we talked about and some of the things Jason. Take with at risk players. Just leave them there. Because all you're going to do there and build up momentum for a customer to go to the press to the media and say they had all the signs that I was in trouble and they did not. We were at all worried in those spend limit or a play limit. You're not getting rid of the customer forever, but what you are doing is putting them in the same way. And if all else fails, you impose a period or a sudden. I have done that myself. On one occasion, the customer went to Look what she's done, a horrible person. It made me stop gambling. It actually was a huge bonus. We'll see it Just to finish off, I would say there's a few pieces missing from the This is what I think they are. Obviously, legislation and regulation. Gary has mentioned that advertising, data protection, there are things out there. Ranjana mentioned religious, or all that kind of stuff. So that it's there, but it's not there as we know. It's not game forms, which we then have within it rules of what is required to us. The other thing that is missing, and Jason alluded to the fact that you know we have studies in the UK in terms of gambling prevalence and what like this. Nothing in India. One of the things I think that would be done relatively quickly, 
not to get some evidence and information about what gaming of the player is really like Funding. There is not enough funding there for dedicated treatment and support. Within a regulated environment, a regulator can say 1% of your revenue has to go to this. Search education. Part of policy nevertheless, and we are the front foot saying we're all going to put some money into a communal pot that makes you look really good. The sector, individual sector, whether you're poker, running, fantasy, esports, or as a collective industry, one of the things you can do is have a public awareness campaign, responsible gaming awareness. One of the cheapest and most effective ways of doing this is you all take out a full page ad in the media. It doesn't cost you that much, but in terms of your representation, the message you're sending out to the world, including your I think one of the things you need to do is openly address the issue of overseas and non-regulated What you have had in the UK is examples of operators who say not in a found backing. It comes very much in case of, you know, do as I say, not as I do. But for Indian operators, this is a huge opportunity for you to go out there and say, just because you see responsible gaming doesn't mean it's really the case. Go out there and start to claw back some of that ground. And the final point I would make is everything we talked about, every time I call into the green that the people not ignore the non ones who go to the racetrack, the ones who are doing telephone testing. One of the best ways for you to show that you care is not just to go out there and do awareness campaigns and education with your own products and sectors. Incredibly powerful you to go out there and say, even if you're playing in the unregulated world, you want to stay safe. What that then does is say to politicians and consumers, when the unregulated market is not getting not acceptable, you guys also that is it. So that um, I think we do have one question, and I think it is by Shriyan. But I think I'll just make the question a little larger and give a little context here. I think a lot of the games, especially the popular ones in India today, apart from the army and the card games and such, they're also targeted a lot at uh, what would fall within kids, basically maybe 18 years and below. Now, um, a lot of the advertisement is also done through, let's say, um, in-app advertisements, which are kind of kids itself. Now, maybe my question is, is UK already looking at this as a problem or as something which they are addressing? If yes, how are they doing that? And two, what would be the recommendation from inferring where advertisements are concerned with the other general laws? So which we could take separately, but how is UK handling the situation? Uh, Jason, do you want to? Or oh, I can, I, I, I don't mind. You, you will have a perspective. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the advertising of, of actual gambling products um, to children is an offence. Um, directing products for betting, lotteries, for gaming, that would include poker, um, that, that's an offence. It's an offence under Section 46 of the Act, and it is also contrary to the, the advertising laws and guidelines. Um, and there's a whole load of things which you can't do those would make advertisements more attractive to children. For example, you shouldn't really show cartoon characters, you shouldn't show um, current professional Premier League uh, footballers, and you shouldn't show people under 25. So a, 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 it's, the, the, there's a two-pronged approach. First of all, it is a, it's an offence to direct adverts to children or young people. 
and secondly, um, it's contrary to the to the general sort of advertising regulations. Again, Ranjana, those rules, the, the gambling advertising rules, were lifted um, from the alcohol advertising rules when gambling was liberalised back in 2007. I think from my perspective, in terms of um, in-net purchases, and, and I think for me the principles would potentially apply to loot boxes and skin betting and gaming as well. Um, regulators are looking at it, but so much of it is down to the, uh, the fact that the game publishers, the content providers, perhaps sit out of the scope of geographical jurisdiction. So you might have things in your national laws and regulations, but you have to actually go and find these people and then possibly. So I think I'm right in saying certainly the UK government should ignore the regulators and looking at loot boxes and looking at how video gaming is, is starting to adapt some of these gambling a big, big kind of works. What you find in the UK, and I hear this from my friends, you know, their their tweenies and their uh, preschool kids are playing some of these games and suddenly you will get a higher or lower gamble figure in there. So Problem. We need to address it. Some of the laws and regulations help in some places. Elsewhere, we still have a lot more work. All right. I think that would definitely answer the questions today. And uh, some of my panelists have very helpfully already sent in response to some of the questions that have been raised on the chat box. With that, we're actually out of time today. We've had a very healthy one and a half hour discussion. Thank you so much for everyone being so patient with us. Jason, Tina, you all have been absolutely brilliant. I'm so glad you all could make time this morning for you. And uh, Corey, thank you for joining today. I'm sure that you've got two more speaking to our audience. We have a lot more catch up with you today. With that, um, I'm going to hand over to our host, Karen. Take it.